Welcome to our seventh episode of All Things Automotive. If you're curious to learn about what AWS is doing in the automotive industry, you've come to the right place. This is a show where we dive deep in the auto tech news, look at emerging technologies and talk with our AWS customers and our own specialists on some of the most important issues in the automotive industry. We've had an exciting season so far with a few more shows planned, all themed around Edge to Cloud, with a focus today on our partnership with Upstream. Making vehicles safer, we really need that. Ready to start your engines, team? That's right, Stefano, let's roll. Welcome everyone, I'm Dean Phillips, Worldwide Tech Lead for Automotive at AWS. Hi, I'm Stefano Marzani, I'm Principal Specialist Solutions Architect at AWS. I'm based in the Motor City, Detroit, Michigan. The automotive industry is in my blood. I have a passion for cars and everything about them. And if you combine that with my love for technology, I can't think of a better industry to be in right now or a better co-host to do the show with. Take it away, Stefano. Thanks, Dean. It's always awesome to be here with you. I'm from the Italian Motor Valley, land of good food and powerful engines, uh, but loving computers as well. Now I'm in the Silicon Valley in California, try to get the best between cars and computers. And there's the perfect and most ambitious combination of the two. Right now, I'm <coughs> very much focused on autonomous vehicle technologies. Yeah, we're really excited for what we've got planned for the show today. We've organized all of our episodes around the theme of Edge to Cloud and Back. And here's a member of our All Things Automotive team, Julia McAndrew, to tell you what's up ahead. We're closing in the end of our journey from the edge to the cloud and back. And it's time to discuss how we protect the massive amounts of data transmitted to and from the cloud with connected mobility services. Security is job zero at AWS, and this week we're showing how we secure smart mobility services, vehicles, and drivers from attacks and misuse with our partners from Upstream. Upstream C4 platform is the first cloud-based cybersecurity solution designed specifically for protecting connected vehicles and smart mobility services from cyber attacks or misuse. We'll be covering how AIML can help protect against hackers with big data and behavior analysis expertise and the tools to easily track and govern data access rights and security updates. So stay the course for episode seven of All Things Automotive and hear about Upstream's patent pending multi-layered security architecture. It's time to investigate cybersecurity with Upstream. Well, after that, I'm ready to go on a road trip. What about you, Dean? Absolutely, my bags are packed and ready to go. But before we bring on our guests, Let's kick things off with a little discussion about current events in the industry. Let's get things going, Stefano. What's driving in the news today? Hey, so Dean, uh, you know that I <clears throat> love everything about autonomous vehicles. Uh, and uh, did you hear that uh, Cruise just received their permit from the state of California to start giving driverless rights to passengers in, this, uh, in their test robot taxi fleet? Of, of course, I can't wait to, to open to it, of course. Yeah, exactly. I heard about that. It's really exciting to see the progress. They have hundreds of uh, autonomous Bolt EVs uh, ready to get <clears throat> tested out on the road. Um, that said, you know, there's a huge focus on safety right now. And as part of this rollout, they have to submit quarterly reports that kind of describe their performance on the technology and uh, also including a, a a plan for their passenger safety uh, as well. Yeah, it's all about safety for sure. Waymo, Zooks, uh, Aurora have permits as well for testing on public roads, uh, but they aren't approved yet for robot taxi service uh, here in California. So that that leads me to bring up Aurora's uh, recent announcement, uh, very interesting about their safety advisory group. Again, it's all about proving to the public that uh, this technology is safe for their use. Yeah, honestly, we should dedicate an entire episode with Aurora on this topic, Um, but uh, we'll just just kind of get into a little bit here. Um, I really like what they've done to address safety in a holistic manner. You know, as you can see in this visual, they have uh, an entire safety culture 
culture built around four pillars. You know, first off, a detailed safety risk management structure, a robust safety assurance program, uh, disciplined safety policy documentation, and safety promotions and education. And, you know, all four of those pillars form a foundational framework where they make their engineering decisions around. But, you know, enough about that. They've also developed a full testing strategy that includes a library of really complex simulations <laughs> experiments or scenarios, you know, like what conditions the vehicles are in, uh, understanding what kind of maneuvers they can make. And uh, the, these sim simulations kind of check how the self-driving software is performing and how it behaves under test. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that stuff? No, you've got some experience in that. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, totally right, Dean. Uh, simulation is a very important uh, component. Uh, and uh, simulation, uh, software simulations are so important for autonomous <coughs> vehicles. So here in this chart, you can see a subset of these maneuvers uh, the Aurora driver needs to master. Every software build must be tested against uh, this library to ensure the safe operation of the vehicle. Uh, it's interesting that they are uh, maintaining a simulation database. Uh, so it's so important to keep track of this simulation and continuously add new ones. You know, when new situations emerge from uh, virtual testing or maybe from data collected on the ground from the real vehicles. And it's a very analytical approach, right? It's an incremental approach. The knowledge of this database grows during time. It's a cycle. And um, it's even very useful to satisfy some uh, new normative uh, requirements that may come in the near future, like SOTI, the safety of the intended functionality, or the even more recent UL 4600. So, and uh, on, on a similar topic, we, re, we even recently saw the launch of this, this <coughs> thing called Safety Pool Scenario Database. That is an initiative that has been stemmed from the work done by the World Economic Forum, uh, whose goal is to really design and deliver a policy framework for the global ass safety assessment of automated driving system. So, as we were saying in the last episode, things are getting more structured, right? To see this autonomy technology to enter the field with clear plans, clearer and clearer plans. It's really good to see. And uh, that's good. And uh, yeah, but uh, of course, after all of this, we'll, uh, we'll wait for an invite from the, from, from the folks from Cruise to test their, uh, to open their system, hopefully. <laughs> Maybe in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, that will be really, really, really good. But again, uh, safety right uh, we're talking a lot about uh, safety and security but uh, how we could not talk about cyber security today's uh, episode my topic right and because we have unfortunately in this case some uh, recent news about that have you seen what uh, what happened to with those critical infrastructures yeah i mean if you if you uh, think about all the stuff that's going on, like with the colonial gas pipeline, the attacks on the different government agencies and, you know, even city water supplies. And the most interesting one to me, uh, I learned yesterday, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, was the attack on JBS, which is one of the world's largest meat producers. And, you know, with that particular attack, we get to bring up the whole topic of cryptocurrency again, which we kind of mentioned in the previous episode. Uh, since JBS actually had to pay them $11 million worth of wow. Bitcoin to regain control of their systems. So it's uh, wow. just kind of crazy what's happening. It's crazy. And uh, we can wonder when it's going to happen uh, to the mobility systems. Yeah, clearly there's a lot at stake if you consider ransomware attacks on mobility infrastructures, city infrastructure, or fleets of vehicles that are on the road. Uh, can you imagine the carnage that would come from something like that? taking over your uh, uh, drive-by-wire system and sending commands to speed up your vehicle, halt your vehicle. Yeah, it's a horror <laughs> scenario, uh, absolutely a hor hor horrific scenario. And uh, th there are uh, solid reasons if you continuously stress that security is priority number zero for AWS and uh, yeah. not only. We'll, we'll talk very soon with our friends, uh, with our friends from Upstream, so absolutely. Yeah, well, that's it. I don't want to hear any more about these attacks. <laughs> Why don't we change lanes and start talking about how we can prevent them from happening by introducing our guests from upstream. Our first guest today is Gil Masuz. Welcome to the show, Gil. Why don't you tell us a little about Hi, yourself? Everyone. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Dean. Hello. 
I'm Gil Mazouz. I'm VP of Engineering at Upstream Security. I'm leading their Upstream's data, machine learning, and software engineering and execution in order to meet uh, the company's business needs. Before Upstream, I was uh, working for nine years at NSO. It was one of the founding teams. And also uh, I founded there the entire data domain, real-time data analytics products and so forth. They have more than 20 years in experience in the industry. And I'm glad and excited to work on new and exciting data platforms. That's really awesome. And uh, we have some passion in common probably here. So, and uh, then we have uh, Jonathan Appel, uh, CTO and co-founder of Upstream. Hi, Dean and Stefano. Uh, pleasure to be here. So I'm Jonathan Appel, Upstream Security CTO. And in Upstream, uh, my job is to drive uh, cybersecurity research and detection work, and also to drive the regulation-related cybersecurity work. Uh, a little bit about uh, my history. So I spent most of my career uh, prior to Upstream in Israeli cybersecurity companies such as Checkpoint, uh, where I developed uh, for many years core technology for Firewall 1, and also at Imperva, where I built web application firewalls. Well, thank you, Gil. Thank you, Yonatan, for joining us today. Uh, can't wait to hear what you guys are going to tell us about cybersecurity and automotive. And so now that we've done our introductions, let's get behind the scenes, or you're better yet, under the hood with Upstream. So today we have an awesome privilege to talk about cybersecurity with one of the leaders in this space, obviously upstream. So Yonatan, why don't you talk to us about you know, what you guys do and uh, kind of set the stage for cybersecurity and automotive. Sure, so first of all at upstream, our focus is protecting uh, connected cars against cybersecurity attacks. And let's look at the market, uh, uh, you know, so today, uh, all of the new or almost all of the new vehicles that are introduced into the market are connected. And this, of course, enables uh, many good things such as uh, mobility services and uh, remote uh, software update to the vehicles. But together with all of this uh, goodness comes a risk because connected vehicles means that uh, vehicles can be attacked both uh, from close uh, range and remotely. And remote attacks can risk millions of vehicles. And, you know, this is not just a theoretical threat. Uh, in the last uh, few years, we're seeing a surge in the number of cybersecurity attacks against connected vehicles. And in fact, uh, between 2016 and 2020, we saw a rise of times nine in the total number of attacks against vehicles. So again, this is not a theoretical thing, it's a real risk. And we at Upstream help OEMs uh, protect themselves against these attacks by detecting them and then uh, mitigating them. And uh, you know, our solution is based on big data analytics and machine learning, and our solution is purely cloud-based. So we have nothing in the vehicle, you know, it's all data-based, cloud-based and analytics-based. That's uh, really, really interesting. And uh, I can't wait to get into the details of all this uh, data play. But uh, let's focus a little bit on, uh, on, on the, still the, 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 big, the big picture of it. So we saw important regulations. So we hear uh, frequently our customers about uh, talking regulations about cybersecurity. For example, the ISO 21434 or uh, the new ones coming from the UNHCR WP29. So, can you please help us to understand a little bit what's the normative, the, 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 the regulations framework here? So, and uh, uh, what has been the impact uh, of these uh, new regulations on the automotive cybersecurity uh, landscape? And uh, are those the major ones, by the way? Is that something that we are missing? Yeah, so, so actually, uh, you know, there are many uh, good regulations for uh, automotive uh, cybersecurity. But yes, today we're seeing uh, two major uh, standards and regulation driving the market. Uh, the first one is, uh, as you mentioned, ISO SAE 21434. This is actually a very deep and comprehensive regulation 
that uh, actually describes how to manage cybersecurity for vehicles, how to do risk assessment and manage suppliers and many more <clears throat> important things. And this uh, standard actually sets the stage and creates kind of a common terminology that helps all the market collaborate in order to secure vehicles ac uh, across the life cycle, you know, development, production, and post-production. The second one is a regulation that's called WP29. And this is a regulation that was recently adopted by 54 countries worldwide. It's driven by the UNECE, which is part of the United Nations. And the important thing about this one is that it's a mandatory regulation, which, which means that an OEM that does not comply to these regulations can actually not uh, sell vehicles in uh, the target countries. So this, this regulation is driving the market today and it has uh, you know many important requirements, but the centric ones are, first of all, the OEM needs to detect upcoming threats and vulnerabilities that can affect uh, the mm -hmm. vehicle, connected vehicle or the data related to the vehicle. The second one is that uh, the OEM must detect cyber attacks based on vehicle logs and uh, mitigate them within a timely manner. And, and these are two very centric requirements that uh, drive the market. Another actually unique uh, and very important thing about WP29 is an annex to uh, the regulation that's called Annex 5. And this annex actually lists specific attacks and attack families that must be mitigated by the OEM. Now, this is quite a comprehensive list, and it's important to understand that many of the attacks in this Annex 5 are related to connected vehicles, again, because the risk in such attacks is very high to the vehicles and to the data. Wow. That's really interesting. Um, it's such a broad uh, threat space to, you know, to cover. Um, Jonathan, can you talk about uh, some examples you know, of cyber threats in the connected car domain? Uh, give us some concrete examples. Sure. So um, actually, uh, you know, the connected vehicle ecosystem is very complex. Uh, the vehicle has uh, near field interfaces and it has remote interfaces. And at least from what we're seeing, all of these interfaces are subject to attacks, but the attacks are not spread evenly between uh, those interfaces and some are more risky than others. So, for example, uh, attacks on servers uh, related to connected vehicles are high risk. Uh, such mm -hmm. attacks are both common and also can uh, affect many uh, vehicles that interact with these servers. And, you know, when you attack the server, you can both uh, steal information uh, of many uh, vehicles and vehicle users but even worse than that, you can also take control of the server. And yes. once you do that, you can attack basically millions of vehicles. So this is uh, uh, an example of an important attack vector. And by the way, uh, between 2019 and 2020, we saw a rise of 73% on attacks on servers. The next one is uh, attacks on key fault. So this is a very common attack that basically uh, enables the attacker to manipulate the key fob interface to the vehicle and actually started uh, without having possession of a physical uh, key and this way to steal the vehicle. And these attacks are actually quite easy to carry out because you can buy the relevant equipment uh, in the internet. And this is why, you know, they're very common. Uh, also the benefit of, is of course very clear because you can steal the vehicle. The third one is uh, attacks from the mobile interface. And, you know, many OEMs today are adding a uh, mobile application that enables the user to control the vehicle. Mm -hmm. So by manipulating this interface, uh, you can take remote control of the vehicle. So again, these are just examples of the high risk and common attack vectors. But like I said, many, many attack vectors and protecting the vehicle is very complex. Yeah, it's uh, really interesting uh, to see how things are uh, mixing up. Yesterday I saw in uh, this car that you just sit and it turns on, right? So that's another nice and neat feature, but uh, it introduces other software functionalities and, and things that needs to be managed and maybe expose a surface 
right for a for a tax so uh, thank you so much for this overview really interesting so Jonathan, we understood that even to address cybersecurity in the right way data is fundamental we saw how much this is important for example for ota with our friends of cibros in the previous episode and uh, we see that data is critical for cybersecurity too because it's not that you just solve OTA or cybersecurity dropping a magic component that solves the problem, right? So what's the role of data? How data is critical for cybersecurity? Yeah, so uh, I fully agree. You know, uh, data is absolutely critical for uh, connected vehicle cybersecurity. And this is because, uh, you know, the ecosystem of the vehicle is so complex. And uh, from our experience, in order to really uh, protect connected vehicles, you need to see multiple types of data and be able to correlate between them. So the first one is actually the vehicle data, which is, of course, uh, vehicle telemetries, uh, which we use to uh, build the vehicle state. The next one is uh, the connectivity data between the vehicle and the server. And the last one is uh, the application data that is used to control the vehicle by the user. So only by seeing all of this data and combining this data, you can really detect attacks and detect the source of the attacks. Uh, and also, I think uh, very interesting is that there is another layer, you know, because you don't mm -hmm. want only to secure a single vehicle. You want to secure the mm -hmm. entire fleet. The entire fleet. And in order to do that, uh, you need to see information of many, many vehicles concurrently and be able to uh, derive insights based on all of this data. And this is exactly what we do in our products with big data analytics and machine learning. So it's not just data, it's a massive amount of data. So, and uh, maybe that's the opportunity for us to uh, get a little bit more technical. And uh, maybe ask uh, Gil uh, to give uh, his perspective, right, as a VP of engineering for uh, upstream. So here we have a massive amount of data coming from connected cars. And uh, Gil, how, how do you make sense of it? So there is a lot, there's a, a lot of data that goes through the system. And uh, we, have, we are having a full process in order to make sense of the data and have insights, useful insights, use case and useful use cases in order to extract from it. So I think I'll better just show it uh, through the visual, with a visual, uh, how the data flows. So we have data flows from uh, the vehicles, from application consumers. The data flows through a process of data ingestion where the data is being first parsed and then normalized into a unified schema and then we can first of all make sense of it you know now the data is clean is understood and we can make sense of it after that what we are doing is deducing the vehicle state which is our digital twin we want to understand what, what the vehicle situation is what the vehicle state is in any in any place and what what the data that is relevant to its state and upon that we are having machine learning models that learns in having use cases for cybersecurity, anomaly detection, um, uh, ownership experience, predictive maintenance, and other use cases as well. If we can show um, uh, the outputs of it on the next uh, visual, we can see that based upon the knowledge that we have from the digital twin, from our machine learning models, from all of this data processing and, anal and, and analytics, we use it for cybersecurity, for detection, for safety, for driver behavior analytics, and so forth. So that's how we make sense of the data. Yeah, it's not just about data at rest either. Uh, we, we hear a lot about event-driven microservices and connected vehicles. And how should we think about cybersecurity in that context? And you've made some interesting discoveries when it comes to this topic. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about how this affects your architecture? Yeah, so what we're actually doing and using is not exactly event-driven microservices, but we're using something that is called event-driven macro services. So I believe Uber, I think, coined that term of macro service. And the reason we use macro service, the reason they used it is because they had thousands of microservices. And it's really hard to maintain so many microservices. So what we do is instead of having this, which is hard to maintain, we're trying to be as much as lightweight as we can. 
And we're having act an actual interesting method of having macroservices, which means taking some modules together according to business logic, to, in, according to its business domain, and hook them together into a macroservice that is separated from other macroservices. So it's not a monolith, but it's not tiny microservices that are hard to maintain. And furthermore, um, what we do, our chief architect, Sagirel, had a really cool method of having a lot of modules, a lot of independent modules. Some of them are dependent via directed at cyclic graph, via DAG. And, have, and each module has its own dependencies. Each module has its own clear and segregated interface. And what you can do is by having a Docker file for a specific module, just promote it to a macro service. What that gives you is a lot of flexibility in the way you're building those macro services because you, you're not need to be locked according to what you've decided first because you know things are changing, the product requirements are changing, and in a very easy manner, you can change between one microservice to the other by deciding to promote which model you want. So you have like Lego components, a lot of Lego components that you can decide how to build. And that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, this whole so, discussion um, kind of reminds me of years ago talking about, you know, service uh, composition, fine grain, coarse grain uh, services back in the SOA days. Uh, I think we're just come full service. <laughs> Full circle, yeah, I should say. Sure. Yeah. So uh, of course, there's a there's a lot of serve there's a lot of composition in our architecture, and uh, and that's the way the data flows. Uh, if you can put the visual again, maybe I could show how how exactly the system architecture works. So what we have here is we're having data that go through Kafka topics. We're using Kafka as our message broker. Um, it has high throughput, it supports back pressure and, and so forth. So it's very good for our needs. So we're, we're getting a lot of amounts of data from uh, the vehicles, from mobility service and telematics. It goes through our um, data ingestion um, uh, server. It, it's called, in, in our, language, in our uh, terms, it's called the normalizer. It goes through parsing normalization and it outputs a unified scheme of signals and uh, private scheme signals as well, according to the specific OEM. Uh, the schema obviously is strongly typed, so you have a very strong assurance about the data itself, what you can do with it and so forth. From that stage, what you have is the service of detection and enforcement, our processor service. All of them, by the way, are above Amazon uh, EKS, Amazon uh, Kubernetes services. So we have in auto scale, scale out abilities. We can use a lot of the services that, as to our requirements. And through the processor stage, we having our actually detection, uh, detection layer, which outputs indicator of attacks, for instance, or indicators of other things, indicator of malfunction and so forth. Uh, we are using uh, uh, policies and vehicle state. We're using uh, rules and alerts, and of course, machine learning models. Well, that's that's cool. Level. Yeah. Yeah. No. Thanks for walking through that with us, uh, especially the whole micro macro service discussion. Uh, yeah. But clearly, there's a lot more to discuss. Uh, but now is the time when we roll up our sleeves in the show and we dive into the nuts and bolts of the topic. So, Stefano, why don't you pop the hood and get us started? Absolutely. So after looking at the architecture and uh, by the way, having these hints about these architectural patterns, uh, very interesting, my, micro, macro, very interesting. So maybe what, uh, what about uh, having a look at uh, how does uh, the system looks for the user perspective? What do you think, Gil? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll definitely, I'll be glad to show you how the, how the system looks. So if we can go over the visuals and I'll, I'll like show how the system works looks like. So what we see here is uh, our dashboard, our, v, uh, our vehicle SOC dashboard. So on the left side, on the top left side, what we can see is a huge amount of vehicles that are going through the system. We have about above 4 million 
active vehicles here. We're having active servers that are sending commands to the vehicle. And we have application consumers, more than 4 million application consumers that uses our, our uh, that uses the services of, of uh, the application or different applications that connect with, with the vehicle. On the right, on the right top, on the top right side, we can see the amount of messages that got in for the last hour or for the last week. Wow. We can see the number of commands, and we can see also um, the application transactions, such as HTTP requests and stuff like that. On the left bottom side, we have the alerts uh, prioritized by severity from critical to low. Here we. We fortunately see that we don't have any critical or high alerts. And on the right side, we have the cyber posture, which also is a shield in the middle represents. And obviously the cyber posture is being derived from the amount of from calculations and amount of critical and high alert that we have or low or medium. So now we're pretty much okay in this area. So let's go over to see the list of alerts. What happens when we see the list of alerts that we have in the system? So as you can see, we have here a list of alerts with different priorities. Uh, we have new alerts, we have in progress, we have alerts that we've tagged as false positive, true positive, and we can see where in the map, where those alerts happened, where those alerts were triggered. So we'd give you a really nice look about what happens in your fleet. Let's dive in into a specific alert. So if I click over a specific alert, let's see what happens. Let's move to the next slide. So yeah, when I click over an alert, we have here an alert of su suspected brute force. So we are suspecting that someone might trying to brute force to use uh, uh, brute force authentication on us. So uh, we can see a lot of aspects regarding this alert. So we have, uh, we can see the number of occurrences that this alert happened. We can see the affected versions of, of how many of the alerts, uh, of the affected version that the alert happened. We also can see a nice timeline, a really nice timeline that shows our, the entire events that the vehicle experienced uh, milestones, we call it, the events that the vehicle experienced in order before the, the alert happened. And it really helps us to see, to, uh, to investigate what happened, to understand what happened prior to the, to the, the case. By the way, those events are also being, are actually being pre-processed by our system in order to have really fast, uh, fast latency when we show them. And uh, below, we are having our digital twin, which as I I'll let you remind, I'm, uh, I'm reminding you that this is our actual vehicle state. And that helps us a lot to understand why this alert was triggered, because we can see the vehicle state when this alert was triggered and all in the prior events as well. If we can move to the next visual, I can show you that digital twin. So you can see we have a mm. long list of signals of fields that represent the state of the vehicle. So we have, for instance, for instance engine speed, RPM, and, and, and uh, uh, the VIN uh, version of, 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 the, of uh, the vehicle and a lot of other, uh, other cool parameters that we can use in order to understand what the vehicle state was when this alert happened. So that allows us to investigate. Um, it's also important for me to uh, emphasize that when we save the data, we are saving it in many different ways. So we, in order to have really fast querying. So when you want to be read optimized, there's a lot of kinds of read optimization. So for the business logic entities, we use Postgres SQL over Amazon RDS, obviously, because that fits. And we use also Redis for state store in order to have fast cache and so forth. And for machine learning, we use obviously Python containers that interact uh, interact with the big data uh, uh, parquet files. So we can see all of this being manifested here in the in the system um, that in order to give us great investigation about alerts that happened in the vehicle. 
And uh, if I may ask a thing here, when something happens, uh, what happens next? So is somebody alerted? Uh, so the customer is, uh, you know, receive a message, a call, or uh, how, how does that, 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 that is managed? Yeah, so when an alert is being triggered, uh, you have an option to have an action, which means you can you now have the detection and response. So you can be connected to many different uh, uh, systems that are doing responses, such as the Misto and so forth, Splunk and so forth, and a lot of other systems as well, that takes that from there and having playbooks that are running in mm -hmm. order to, uh, to, to uh, uh, handle this alert. Thank well, you. That, Very interesting. Yeah, it's a really comprehensive system, and uh, you can start to visualize, you know, how you identify an alert and, and react to it, and kind of dive in to figure out what the root cause is. But uh, clearly, cybersecurity is such an important topic in automotive, and one that requires a lot more investment and research and development, kind of reduce our exposure to these bad actors um, in the industry, but. That said, um, thank you so much for joining us today, Jonathan and Gil. Um, really enjoyed this and can't wait to see where this partnership takes us. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks a lot. It was really cool. Really pleasure to be here. Glad that you're having us. Yeah. Thanks, uh, even from me, Jonathan and Gil, really awesome and a super important topic, really. Thank you for... Uh, the work you're doing, really. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, so thanks again um, for joining us, guys. But um, now's the time in our show where we talk about upcoming events in the industry that you might enjoy uh, or uh, discuss some different things going on. So Stefano, what's coming up around the corner? Yeah, sure. This is the segment uh, where Dean and I share uh, uh, what we think are really interesting events and resources. And we're certainly heading into a season of great ways to learn more about innovations uh, in the automotive space. And uh, Dean, what, what are the events coming in the next week or that just happened and we missed? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think in this case, uh, I'll mention that it, it just happened. But uh, James Kuffner had a keynote at the AWS Summit Online. Um, uh, it's a chance to learn about um, what, what they're doing uh, at Woven. Um, but also what other customers are doing about in cloud computing and machine learning. Uh, so that that's for our EMEA uh, online summit uh, that happened on the, on the 10th of June. Yeah, very interesting. And uh, Dean, uh, you're heading to my homeland, uh, right? In a couple of weeks. Uh, <laughs> why don't you yeah. tell us about that? Yeah, we've, of course, talked about this a lot on the show. We're looking forward to it. Uh, I'll be heading to the Italian Motor Valley Fest uh, on July 1st and 2nd, where I'll uh, be speaking uh, with some other folks uh, at, at the Motor Valley Fest event uh, in Modena. Uh, so uh, excited to do that and talk with some uh, of the different Italian automotives um, and uh, understanding what they're doing and, and, and kind of what we're doing in the industry. So I'm looking forward to that. It's time to get out yeah. of the office and out of the basement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I really see that uh, and I'm a little bit jealous. Uh, I'm not sure uh, probably if I will be there in person or any way, I will be there for sure in uh, virtual on uh, July the 2nd uh, in, one of the, in one of the panels as well. So yeah, it would be an awesome event, hopefully. Yeah, definitely. But that said, uh, hopefully you all enjoyed our show today uh, and that uh, David Hale, he's our chat moderator. He, he put some interesting articles and uh, blogs in, in, the, in the chat for you to reference and, and hopefully he was able to address your questions uh, provided with those resources. But uh, if you are catching this on demand, just send along comments or questions to media series live streams at amazon.com or use the hashtag all things automotive. Yep, and the show doesn't end here yet. We have uh, one more regularly scheduled episode uh, focused on machine learning and how we're using that technology uh, with customers, specifically with the SageMaker platform. Uh, we'll have Suchitra on from our uh, 
machine learning uh, uh, solutions lab team. Uh, we're going to get into some really cool topics and some emerging technologies in that space, specifically around federated learning. Can't wait to, to dig into that. Absolutely. Such a central topic, absolutely. Uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, we saw even in today's episode how much that uh, this is really becoming important. So can't wait to talk with Suchi. Yeah, and uh, also forgot to mention, we've got a ninth episode where we're kind of looking around the corner. So the whole episode will be focused on that, um, where we have some analysts on to discuss uh, what they think uh, the future in automotive holds. So that about wraps it up. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on our seventh episode oh. of All Things Automotive uh, oh. and that you enjoyed the time with Upstream. And we hope to see you back next time. Thanks so much for joining us and see you next time on All Things Automotive.